blessed and be encouraged by, by that word as well. Hallelujah. Our scripture lesson this morning is from John's Gospel, chapter 21. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew, or John chapter 21. In the NIV it reads, Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, that is the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called Didymus, that meant the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that was James and John, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. And so they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they replied, or they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you just, you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Some of the disciples dared, uh, some of the, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. And this was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly more love me more than these? Jesus, and, and, yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep or feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you... You dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you are old and you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. Thank you, Lord, for your word this morning as it's been sung as it's been testified to. And now, Lord, as we've read it, we pray, Lord, oh God, your spirit and your word would shape and mold us. Touch our hearts. Make us more like Jesus. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. I really appreciate Nancy's testimony this morning. I really appreciate the last word that you said, that our past does not have to determine our future. You know, 
people are asking me that question right now. They're saying, Pastor, what's, going, what's coming? What, what's going to happen next? You know, when can we get back to normal? Well, do you want to go back to normal, Nancy? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we can go back to normal. We can't go back to what it was. God's always got more. Hallelujah. God has always got more that he wants to do. And I believe that the circumstances of our life, as difficult as they might be, as dark as they might become, as things take place that are confusing and they make no sense at all, and, and we get dealt these hands that, that are uh, far, far away from God's plan. God, at any moment, can step in. At any moment, he can stand on the seashore. At any moment, he can give us instructions to fill the nets once again. Hallelujah. That's what this story is about. I don't know when we're going to reopen. I don't know when the church is going to be able to get back to normal. And if that is really what we want to be. Listen, sometimes normal mean, is, is, has not been all that fruitful. Somebody say amen. Sometimes we want, if we want to have, be fruitful and we want to follow hard after God. If we want to see the, the bounty and the abundance of the kingdom of God. Then we've got to let go of what was normal. We've got to let go of that. We've got to embrace. Embrace the, as Paul said, oh, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. And the power of his resurrection. It's interesting that this story takes place in that in between time. Jesus had raised from the dead the resurrection, but he had not ascended back into heaven yet. And so there were these comings and goings. He appeared here. He talked to the two on the road to Emmaus and, and revealed himself. He, he appeared in, in the upper room when all the doors and, and windows were locked. And there he was right in their midst. And, and now he stands on the seashore there in the Sea of Galilee. And, uh, uh, and he appeared to them and... Uh, he is going to show them and talk to them and reveal himself to them. The question sometimes is asked, what's next? All right. Well, what's next is unimaginable. What's next is unimaginable. God is up to something. And the stage is being set for that. This story unfolds uh, as one of my favorite stories. It's, it's almost like John remembered one more thing to write. If you read chapter 20 and you end that chapter, it's almost like John is about ready to put a bow on the end of that chapter and say, okay, that's the story and I'm sticking to it. And then all of a sudden, John remembers one more story to tell. And he goes afterward, after that, after chapter 20, there's one more thing I need to tell you. One more story. Simon Peter and James and John and Thomas and Nathaniel and a couple other disciples were together when Simon Peter wanted to go back to normal. He said, let's, you know, I, I think I'm going to go fishing. I don't know what else to do. I don't know what's next. It's in the in-between time. Uh, yeah, Jesus is raised from the dead. But what does that mean? How does that play out? What, does that gonna, what kind of an impact is that going to make in my life? And then so Simon Peter, and this is, this, is, this, is, this is human nature. This is what we do. We always try to go back to what we've always done. But if we always do what we've always done, we're always going to get what we've always gotten. You know, and so Simon Peter wanted to go back to what, I'm going to go fishing. That's what I know what to do. Uh, I don't know what else to do. I don't know what's next. And so Simon Peter talked to the other, and the others all joined in. They didn't know what else to do either. So they all joined in and they gravitated. They moved towards what was familiar and see, there's a danger in that, my friends. You know, and when we reopen or when we move through this, when this COVID-19 passes, there will be a strong tendency to, to try to go back to what we're familiar with. But that 
may be a trap. That may not be what we think it is because things have changed. Listen, you've changed. We've changed. The world has changed. So how can we go back to all that was familiar? The the other thing I want to point out too is that Simon Peter, the disciples, they all knew that Jesus had raised from the dead. But listen, without, without the power of the Holy Spirit then we're just simply operating in our own strength. We're simply operating in what we know, in what we think is familiar, what we think is normal, what we think we're supposed to do. Instead, it's interesting that this story concludes by just Jesus saying to Simon Peter, follow me. I know the way through the wilderness. I know where to go and follow me. And we need for that to have the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the tendency is for us to try to live in our own strength. Try to live in our own smarts. And try to live in what is familiar. But listen, that is not God's plan. That is not God's purpose. There is a new normal. That new normal is in the Holy Spirit. And through the baptism and, and the power of the Holy Spirit. But Simon Peter hadn't learned that quite yet. The disciples hadn't learned that quite yet. And so they went out and they, they fished all night and caught nothing. They caught nothing. Their nets were empty. Well, early in the morning, Jesus stands there, stands there at the, uh, at the shore, on the shore on the beach. Now, the, it was starting to get light outside. They'd fished all night. They were tired. And Jesus calls out to them from the shore. And, and, the, and the way that he, he calls out to them, he, he asks them a question. He says, haven't you caught any fish? He asks the question in such a way, it's almost as if he knew that their nets were, were empty. You know, he, he didn't say, how many fish have you caught? <laughs> he already knew that they hadn't caught any fish. And so he asks the question, haven't you? Haven't you caught any fish? He already knew how empty their nets and how empty their hearts were. And so he asked that question. Now the disciples didn't recognize him. They didn't realize that it was Jesus. Maybe it wasn't light enough outside. They could see a figure there. Maybe they didn't, didn't realize that it was Jesus. They weren't, certainly were not expecting him. Haven't you any fish? That was more of a statement. <laughs> that was more of a statement than it was a question. And, and, and why did he ask that question in such a way? I think it's because he wants us to face the reality. He wants us to be honest. You know, somebody on the shore asking a question of a fisherman that's been a fisherman all of his life out in the boat. You know, fishermen have a tendency to exaggerate. Well, it was this big. No, it was, it was, wow, you know, it was this big, you know. (laughs) But Jesus wasn't going to let him get away with that, and he's not going to let you get away with it either. He wants honesty. He wants us to be completely honest. Honest and transparent. You see, that is such an important key to getting anywhere with the Lord. You have to begin with reality. You have to begin with honesty. You have to confess your sin. You won't get anywhere with the Lord pretending. I appreciate your testimony this morning, Nancy, because you were sharing... You are sharing some very difficult things that many of us have never experienced before. But that's not where your story goes. That's where it started. But it had to start there in order then for you to glorify God in your life. And that's where it went. But it had to start with where we're at. You can't pretend with God. You can't pretend like everything is fine. You know, churches are really bad at that. We try to say, well, okay, I'm good. I put my church face on. That's called churchianity. That's not called Christianity. And we put our church face on. And we pretend, oh, I'm good. I'm fine. Everything's cool. But listen, you don't get anywhere with the Lord until you confess. Till you own. That's what confess means. Confess means to own up. To own up. And Jesus was just waiting for those disciples to, to admit 
I got nothing. <laughs> I fished all night and I got nothing. I got nothing. No, honesty about our present reality and our need of Jesus is key. It's key. Because then, then once we are honest with God, then we can choose faith and we can put our faith and trust in him because he does have everything. He does have it all. He has everything that we need. But as long as we're pretending like we got part of it together, he's not going to give us all that he is in our lives. So confession and owning up is necessary for faith To help us lay hold of the promise. Of the promise. Verse 6, he says, throw your net on the other side. On the right side of the boat. uh, And you'll find some. Now, listen, you got to understand, for these fishermen, that made no sense at all. Uh, that, 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 you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know right or left. I do, I do know that this was on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. I do know that the sun came up uh, in the east uh, and set in the west. So maybe, maybe the sun would have uh, cast a shadow uh, on the boat. And, and, you, and I know a little bit about fish, fishing to know that, you, that oftentimes shadows on the water scare fish away. <laughs> and that might have very well been the case. Jesus told them to cast their net into the shadow. Because that's where you'll find a great catch. That's where you'll find some, he said. Listen, his word, obedience to his word, following specific instructions. That's why I'm excited about this course we're going to offer this summer about how to hear the voice of God. Following his specific instructions. Instructions, learning to hear God's voice, to hear his voice. And we need that. We need that in the day in which we're living. We need that for the days ahead. We need to hear God's voice. We need to obey what he said, even when it doesn't always make sense. In order for there to be an abundant catch. So abundant that they couldn't haul the, couldn't haul the net in. So full of fish. But when they finally did pull it in to the shore, it still was not torn. They even had a, an exact count of how many large fish were in that net. When he, when he cried out from the shore, I love how it, John said to Peter, he said, that's the Lord. That's the Lord. And I like how, I like how John describes himself too. The disciple whom Jesus loved. (laughs) Makes me smile every time I think about it. But you know what? Then I thought, doggone it. I'm the one that he loves. And you're the one that he loves. No, no, he, he really loves me. But he, no, he loves us all. We're all the one. We're all the beloved. We're all the ones that he loves. And I've said many times here, God really loves this church. Well, I know he loves all the churches. I know that he loves all the people. Oh, but he really loves this church. He really loves you. He really loves me. Then Jesus invited them, come and have breakfast. That is such an interesting piece of this story, I think, that, that, that he, uh, uh, he, he had prepared breakfast. He had, he had made a fire. This is before they got on the shore. He had made a fire. He had somehow gotten some fish, put the fish on the fire. He'd even provided some bread for them. And then he said, oh, and bring some of the fish that you just caught. Why? I think it's because he knew they were going to want seconds. (laughs) You know, you, you fish all night. You're going to probably want seconds. In fact, the smell of that fish and the smell of that bread on an open fire after you fished all night, I'll bet you they were really hungry. In fact, I'm getting hungry talking about it right now. Jesus said, come, come and have breakfast. Come and eat. 
And oh, by the way, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. And then note this. He served them. Jesus served them. Uh, it's such a great picture of Jesus. Such an awesome picture. He, he served them. Maybe, maybe it brought back memories of how that he took the towel in the basin and he washed their dirty, dusty feet. Maybe, maybe there were other occasions when Jesus just served them, loved them, cared for them. He served them. And then after eating, Jesus, Jesus took Simon Peter aside and they went for a little walk maybe he maybe he left the other disciples do the dishes guys while I'm gone I want to talk to Peter alone and they went for a walk on the on the water's edge and the conversation was interesting and and in order to understand exactly how interesting it was I need to give you a little Greek language lesson okay there there are a number of words that are translated in the Bible for the word love One of them is the word agape. Agape love is the strongest kind of love. It's unconditional love. It's a willful, committed love. Has nothing to do with your past. Has nothing to do with anything that you've done. How many times you failed and fallen. He loves you unconditionally. At agape love of God. Hallelujah. It's not based on circumstances. It's not based on the weather. It's not based on the pressures and the stresses. It's not based upon a virus. Uh, It's not based upon the fear of man. In fact, this love is what casts out uh, all fear. The agape love. It's the strongest because it's not based on a feeling. It's not based on a whim. It's based upon a willful decision to love, to love unconditionally. The other kind of love is the word phileo. And phileo meant love. It was a friendship love. It was a, it was a mutual kind of love. I love you. You love me. We're in a relationship with one another. Whether, uh, see, agape love doesn't matter whether you love me back. I'm still going to love you because it's unconditional. But phileo is a two-way love. It's, an, uh, it's a friendship love. It is a, an emotional love. Phileo really is based on feelings. And, and this kind of phileo love, it can be strained. You know, we've all had friendships. We've all had relationships that have been strained because of something somebody said. And we trusted them. We loved them. And then they hurt us in some way or another. And sometimes betrayal and that hurt is really painful. Why? Because we loved them. We were in a relationship with them. Phileo love is that personality, that chemistry, that likability, uh, how they treat us and how we treat them. It's what we're, it's, it's a mutuality that is mutually beneficial to each other. But it's based on feelings and it, it is affected by circumstances. Okay, those are the two words. Now let me tell you, this, read the story to you again. Or tell you the story again. Jesus said to Peter. Do you agape love me? Do you love me unconditionally? Do you willfully love me? More than these. Now let me just pause. I'm going to finish that about the love and and the words. But. First of all, I want us to make sure we understand what's he pointing at. We don't know what he's pointing at. He says, more than these. Oh, Lord Jesus, what do you, Jesus, what do you, what do you mean by these? Are you, are you pointing to the boats? And is that your question? Jesus, or Peter, do you love me more than you love these boats? Do you love me more than you love your career? Peter, do you love me more than your livelihood? Peter, do you love me more than your occupation? Do you love me more than these? Oh, maybe he was asking it in a different way. Maybe he was asking me, 
asking Peter, Peter, do you, do you love me more than you love your past? Your normal life. What you're familiar with. What you're comfortable with. Do you love me? Do you, do you love me more than you love your comfort? Do you love me more than you love your, uh, your past, your familiarity, uh, your surrounding? Do you love me more than these? You know, I, I, I remember a time in my life, and I've talked to others as well, when we'd say, we were saying things like, well, I'm afraid to say, yes, Lord, I surrender, because then he's going to send me someplace where I don't want to go. <laughs> He's going to send me to outer Siberia or to Mongolia or he's going to make me eat worms. And, you know, and we're, we're afraid. But do you understand? He said, Peter, do you agape love me more than these? You know, he could have been pointing to the, his other disciples. He could have been pointing to James and John who were partners and relatives of Peter and Andrew. He could have been pointing to the other disciples. I mean, they'd been close family. They were family for three years following Jesus around. And sometimes, you know what? The Lord does ask us, do you love me more than you love them? And it doesn't mean that we have to necessarily walk away from family and friend. But Jesus did say something about that. That you need to love me more than wife and father and mother and brother and sister and farm. and on and on. I mean he just listed. Do you truly love? In fact in the NIV that's the way it says. Do you truly love me? There, it's, it's because... They, the translators knew that he was talking about agape love, unconditional love. Let me ask you the question before I move on. What is Jesus pointing to in your life and heart? When he asks us the question, do you love me more than these? What's he pointing to? That, that's, a, that's a serious question, my friends. Especially at this time juncture that we're in right now as a church and maybe as a as believers uh, in this day and age we need to make sure that we love him supremely unconditionally willfully committed to Simon Peter's answer yes Lord you know that I love you it's interesting Peter didn't use the same word Jesus says, Peter, do you agape love me? Peter's response was, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo love you. That wasn't the question. But that was Peter's answer. And then Jesus went right ahead. Said, well, then feed my lambs. If you love me, even, even with feelings, even with mutuality, even with a friendship love... I still have an assignment for you. Feed my lambs. And then Jesus repeats it. Asks the same question. Peter, do you truly love me? Do you agape love me? And Peter's response was, again, Lord, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo love you. Again, that wasn't the question. But Jesus went ahead then take care of my sheep. Then the third time, and this time that got Peter. Not only, not only did it get him that Jesus asked him a third time, but it got him because of the way Jesus asked the question. Because what Jesus, the question now was, Peter, he didn't say, Peter, do you agape love me? He said, Peter, do you even phileo love me? He didn't use the word even. <laughs> I added that. But he asked that. Do you a phileo love me? In other words, Peter, do you even? Can you even say phileo love? You see, Jesus, and the, it, Jesus asked the third time, but it was a different question now. The question had changed from agape to phileo. 
Jesus changed the question. And maybe Jesus takes us right where we're at. What, what we've got to bring to him. Because I tell you what, I still don't fully know my own heart. We don't know our own heart fully. That's why we have to let the Spirit search our hearts. And Jesus' response to Peter, uh, P- Peter's response to Jesus, and this is, this is great, because he'd asked him three times, and Peter's response was, this time, on the third time, Peter said, and, and, and I think the reason why he answered this way was because he remembered that he had denied knowing the Lord three times. Peter said, Lord, you know all things. <laughs> I might as well be honest with you, Lord, because you really do know my own heart. You know that I love you. Jesus' response was, then feed my sheep. And then he followed that by saying to Peter, he said, follow me, follow me. And that's the way I want to conclude this message this morning is I want us to to hear that loud and clear. Follow me, Jesus said. Follow me. And I believe that's what Jesus is saying to us right now as we still are in the midst of this Sheltering in place, still in the midst of this coronavirus pandemic. Jesus is saying to it, now follow me. Follow me. Listen, we can't imagine what is coming. We may think we know. Oh, we'll just get back to normal. Everything will open up and we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And ball games this summer, vacation on it. No, 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 no. You can't imagine what God is doing. I do believe we're in the last days. I do believe the stage is being set. I do believe that the Lord is bringing things forward. There are too many things pointing. Pointing to. And, and I think it, we've got to trust him. We've got to follow him. And we've got to trust him trust in Jesus you you can't go back to normal normal was for many of us was fruitless it's not at all what God wants for us they had fished all night and their nets were empty and maybe this morning if you're honest if you're honest with the Lord you might say the same thing we got nothing we fished all night and our nets are empty. But Lord Jesus is saying to us, throw your net on the right side of the boat. Throw your net over here. I'll show you how to catch fish. I'll show you where they're at. I'll show you where, the, where you'll catch fish. You see, God always has more. Listen, my friends, today... Today would be, right now, would be an opportune time to surrender. We sang the song, I Surrender All. Today would be an opportune time to surrender, to make that commitment to follow Jesus. Make a a fresh surrender. Maybe you've already been a follower of Jesus. You trust him. Maybe you've received the gift of eternal life. But maybe now is a time, right now at this moment, now is a time to make a fresh surrender. Maybe for our church, this is a time for us to get a fresh surrender, a fresh commitment to following Jesus wherever it might lead. Wherever it might lead. And maybe... Maybe there are some that are watching and listening this morning that this is the first time you've made a commitment. The first time that you've really honestly, honestly surrendered to Him. Pray this prayer with me. Just pray this prayer in your own mind and heart. Dear God, I admit that I need you. I need you in my life. 
I need you to take over my life. I'm tired of living according to circumstances, according to the weather, according to whatever is blowing through at the moment. I want you. I want you, Lord. Please forgive my sins and my unbelief and my selfish ways. I believe, Jesus, you are the Son of God. You are the Savior. You are the Lord. And that you died for me on the cross. You took my place in order to pay, make full payment for all my sins and to save me through your blood. I now call upon you, Lord, to save me. I now call upon you, Lord, to give me the gift of salvation and new life. I invite you, Lord. I open up my heart. Come and live in me. Live in me. I now surrender and commit myself to follow you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. Make me and making me part of your family. In your precious and wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to have Matt and uh, Rob play for us that song we learned last week, The Blessing. Uh, And so I invite you. It's a powerful song. And we're going to end our service with that song this morning. Let's sing it. Surrender to God comes with great blessing. He not only invites us, but he is eager to pour out his favor, his mercy, his grace, his grace, time and time again. So let us surrender and receive.
your favor upon your church. May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and the children, and the children. May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations. May your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations. And your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations. children. Oh, may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you. He's with you. He is with you. He is with you. In the morning, in the evening, in your coming, in your going, in your weeping, in rejoicing. He is for you. He is for May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.